Alright, hello. Welcome to Yesterlore. <laughs> Sorry for the long delays today. Uh, there were some technical difficulties that we had, but uh, I think I figured them out. Uh, we're just having some sound issues, some, um, and some just general getting my streaming um, tools to work today. So um, we have started 40 minutes later than I had planned, so we're probably just gonna push the end to this later. Um, but I've prepared to talk about three riddles today. You actually see four on the screen, and that's just because I couldn't find a better zoom for it. Um, I plan to get to three riddles today, and then I'm just gonna save the other three for um, the next Yester lore that we do. Um, so our plan is to do the first three riddles that you see here. Um, they're the different paragraphs. But first I'm gonna talk about what these riddles are and how we're going to go about doing these riddles. Someone in the chat says they're hyped for the riddles, thank you. Uh, I am too. Uh, so let's get started. So um, the riddles that we're reading are from a text that's commonly called nowadays the Greek Anthology, which is actually a couple anthologies put together from different time periods. Um, ridiculously excited, that's really good. <laughs> Ridic ridiculous. Um, so yeah, we are going to look at some riddles from ridiculously. yeah. Um, I am ridiculously excited as well. So we're going to do some ridiculous riddles um, from the Greek anthology, which as I was saying, it's two anthologies put together um, from different time periods. And the particular section of the Greek anthology we're looking at is from what's called the Palatine Anthology, um, the copies of which we have from between, I think it's the 10th century to the 14th century. Um, so this is medieval Greek text that we're looking at, but the text itself goes back much further. It's just the copy that we have. So um, let's take a look at the copy. Um, this is just from the Greek anthology. Um, it's not from the page that we're looking at, but this is what the manuscript looks like. Um, uh, this is just like an image I was able to find from the Greek anthology, um, but it's not, I, I can't find anywhere available a digitally available copy of the manuscript, which is unfortunate because it would be really fun to read from the manuscript like this with a lot of ligatures and abbreviations and stuff that would make it really tricky. But we are not doing that. Um, the section that we're looking at is from a section of the anthology that is mostly actually word problems, like mathematical word problems. And all of these word problems are attributed to um, someone named Mitrodoros or Metrodorus. And he was a grammarian. There are a lot of Metrodoruses from ancient Greece, but this, this person was a grammarian and mathematician who probably lived in the 500s during the reigns of uh, Justin and Anastasius in the Byzantine Empire. Um, so 500s-ish. So we're getting into like early medieval Greek here when this was written, at least recorded by Metrodorus. But we're pretty sure Metrodorus was just saving or copying down some earlier texts um, written way earlier. I think there's some that are given the name Socrates. I'm not sure if we think that Socrates actually composed them, but we can tell by just the language used, the word choice, the grammar, and the expected pronunciation based on the scansion of these poems, basically. It's written in elegiac lyric poetry. Um, it's alternating dactylic hexameter and dactylic pentameter. Um, it's basically poetry, but we, there are math problems and riddles. <laughs> um, we could tell from the language, in any case, that it dates back to a much earlier time because the Greek is very ancient, given how it's expected to be read. Um, like epic Homeric uh, Greek, not Byzantine 
uh, medieval Greek. However, because it was written by Metrodorus, I've decided that how we're going to read it tonight <laughs> is going to be in medieval Greek. Um, some big differences are there are a lot fewer sounds in terms of vowels. It is not pitch accented like ancient Greek is. It is stress timed like modern Greek. And it's going to sound a lot more like modern Greek when I read it in Byzantine Greek. Um, I'm going to read it in sort of early medieval Greek since this is from the 500s. But um, some things to note are that some sound changes that have gone into play in modern Greek have already started in the medieval Greek period, even in the 500s. So it's not going to sound quite like the composers originally intended it to be read. But this is probably how Metrodorus himself would have heard it or said it if he was speaking to himself aloud um, these riddles. So I've just plucked out from amongst the uh, many, many, many math word problems <laughs> in this section, the riddles that are not math word problems. Maybe if people are interested, another day we could read some of the math word problems, but that's not my particular interest. Um, I wouldn't mind doing it if enough people wanted to. Um, we could do some ancient Greek math, uh, but we're, that's not what we're doing today. Now, This first riddle that we're reading is from uh, basically stanza five. Well, I'm not sure if they should be called stanzas. They're basically sections of this part of the Palatine Anthology by Metrodorus. Um, basically, there's numbered sections. Each one is basically a poem, a separate poem, but it alternates between you know lots of word problems and then every so often you just get a riddle. And so I kind of picked the riddles out, or some of the more interesting riddles, and guessable riddles. Uh, now, why aren't we reading from, if not a manuscript, some kind of website? Uh, it's because I can't find a digitized version, either. I couldn't find a um, digitized facsimile of the manuscript, and I could also not find a good source for the actual Greek. It was actually notoriously hard to find the... Um, Greek text of the Palatine Anthology. Uh, you can actually find the Palatine Anthology on Wikibooks. You can actually read a translation. Um, I might link that if I'm able to find it, but um, it's basically if you go to Greek Anthology, the Wikipedia page, in the external links there should be a link to the Wikibooks of the translation of all of the Palatine Anthology. But we're not reading translation. The copy I was able to work from to make this actually had the translation right next to it, and that's not as fun. Uh, so I basically typed everything out separately in a Word document. <laughs> or not a Word document, this is a Google document. Um, and uh, I found a nice font for the Greek, and uh, that's what we're reading from. So I, I just had to copy this down. There is a chance there might be some mistakes in copying it down. I did double check it again before we streamed today, but uh, there still could be some mistakes. Uh, so if I'm able to catch those, I'll point them out in the description of the video when this goes up on YouTube. So, without further ado, let's get started with the first riddle. So, uh, first what we have here, this sort of grayed out thing, is, um, maybe I should try to zoom in one more time actually. I think that should be people. I think some of the text got cut up cut off, so I'm going to alter the stream a bit so it's not cut off. There we go. Um, adjusting a bit. Sorry if this is jarring. <laughs> Move my camera a bit too. Um, yeah, we should be good now. Okay. So this first uh, grade out what looks like an E here. That is the letter uh, Epsilon, but Epsilon is also, when we put a line over it, the number five, the numeral five. Greek didn't have separate numbers, like numeral characters. They reused the alphabet for numbers, and this was a pretty common thing in the Eastern Mediterranean to do. Um, so basically there are number values for each of the letters in the alphabet, and when you go from alpha to theta, that's one through nine, and then uh, kappa 
down to the next nine are the tens up to 90. And then once you get past those, you get hundreds. And then after that, you start going back to alpha and do thousands, which can lead to some ambiguity in the numbers when you have alpha and then other stuff. Um, like the place values get pretty tricky. And there's been some different variations over the centuries on how to like solve that ambiguity, um, different markings for the letters. But fortunately, we don't have <laughs> that many stanzas to worry about, so we don't need to worry about that kind of thing. Basically, epsilon here is five. It's the fifth um, poem in this section of the anthology. And I think it's the first riddle in the anthology, if I remember correctly. I didn't think there were any riddles before this one. Um, and I'm going to start by reading the first line. Now, it's um, actually the first couplet, because it's written in elegiac couplets, I think I said before. Uh, alternating dactylic hexameter and dactylic uh, pentameter. I'm not going to read it in that meter, because that meter is native to ancient Greek, which this I'm not going to read it in ancient Greek. I'm going to read it in medieval Greek. So, um, uh, so we've got... Imi patros lefkio melan tekos apteros ornis acri ke uranion iptamenos nepheon. Uh, so imi, we've got to start with is just the word I. It, it's actually related to the word am in English. Imi means I am. So I am. And then we've got patros, and patros means of the father. It's father in the genitive singular. So it's like fathers. And then we have lefkio, lefkio, which is uh, the word white in the genitive singular as well. And it's in a sort of Homeric Greek variant of the genitive singular. So it's, I am of a white father. Um, okay, so of a father who is white, so the, the case of white, which is genitive, and father, which is genitive, match, so we can tell that the white describes father. I am of a white father, and then we've got the word melan, which is the color black. Melan. This is where we get the word melanin from in English. Uh, melan is the color black in ancient Greek. Melan, uh, and melan is actually just in the plain form, uh, like the subject case. So it's going to be describing whatever the am is. I am. So black. And then we have this word, tekos, which is a Homeric or ancient, epic ancient Greek uh, word for child. I am the black child of a white father. That's what we've got so far. Imi patros lefkio melan tekos. I am the black child of a white father. Already sounds kind of riddly. Then we've got apteros ornis. Okay, this is also interesting. Ornis means bird. Um, it's uh, the root is ornith, and it's in words like ornithology, the study of birds. Ornis is bird, and apteros. Pteros means wing. Pteros, the P-T there. You might have seen this root in the word like pterosaur or pterodactyl, the P-T. Uh, apteros, though, that A suffix, we actually borrowed this into English from Greek. It means like the opposite of. So it's wingless. So I am the black child of a white father, a wingless bird. Then we've got, on the next line, Achri ke uranion itamenos nepheon. So, Achri means even, like even to some kind of extent. And then we have the word ke, which is and. <laughs> What you'll notice about Greek word order is, especially in poetry because they're trying to fit in a meter that's very difficult to fit, words are just going to come in whatever order makes the most sense for the meter. So um, we always have to unscramble it. And the cases actually help with that, the ancient Greek cases. Like I could tell from the shape of this word that it's the subject, even though it's not even close to the beginning of this sentence, <laughs> just because of the just because of the case. And that's typical of ancient Greek. 
So we have Ethan up to, and then we have the word and. Those don't really go in order, so we'll have to unscramble that. And Uranion. Now this word is actually related to the planet uh, Uranus. Um, Uranus is the god of the sky, or I guess the titan of the sky, I should say. Um, but Uranion means heavenly as an adjective, heavenly. And it's in the date, or sorry, genitive plural. So something like of something plural, heavenly something plural. Then we've got this word, iptamenos, iptamenos, which means flying. And it's a participle. It means like flying is happening. And then we have nefeon. And nefeon is also, it also has this on ending here. It's a, another genitive plural. So it's of, and then nef, this is nefeon, means of the clouds. Um, this is distantly related to the word nebula in Latin. Um, nebula is like clouds, uh, or like fog, haze. I'm trying to think if there's any other roots that this is related to in English. They're not coming to me at the moment. But now we know that heavenly describes the clouds here. So flying is our action. And then we have heavenly clouds in the genitive plural. And then we have this word akri. And akri even too actually takes the genitive plural. So that tells us that this heavenly clouds is the, what the even too refers to. So. Let's kind of go back to the beginning and re-unscramble re this, I guess. Re-unscramble. <laughs> We've got, I am the black child of a white father, a wingless bird, flying, and then, or maybe we should put the and first, a wingless bird, bird, and flying even to the heavenly clouds. Or maybe the and can come before the, not the wingless bird. Um, it's not really clear, and it doesn't really change the meaning all that much either, um, which is probably why it's fine. It is poetry after all, so it's going to be a little ambiguous. Um, so, so far, black child of a white father, wingless bird that can fly even up to the heavenly clouds. Okay, let's keep going. We've got cures, cures. Dantomenisin. Or sorry, that should be dando, dantomenisin. I forgot to <laughs> undergo the sound change there. Dantomenisin. Dantomenisin. So, cures is actually a dative plural. It's towards many, or having to do with many of something, is the dative plural. And the word here is an epic Greek form of the word kori, which means. Uh, girl. However, it can also mean pupil, like the pupil of an eye. Um, I'm not sure, I don't remember what the connection there is, but the word is used for both things. The, eye, the pupil of the eye, um, and it's also the word for girl. And it can mean a few other things too. Um, so it's, I think here it's to the pupils, or pupils, date of plural. Um, we'll see if the data plural matters later. It probably will. Um, then we've got this D apostrophe here. It's pronounced V at this stage in Greek. And basically, this is the same word as this word right under here. It's it's they. And it is basically another particle that means and or but. But it can never come first in a phrase. It always has to come second <laughs> in the sentence. Even if it's like, in English, we put the and first. So you start a new sentence and, you're, and you say, and then, and then you have your next thing. Well, you start with whatever the first word is, and then you put they. <laughs> um, but here, because the next word starts with a vowel, in poetry, a lot of the time, what you'll see is that it'll just become the apostrophe. Here, so cures van to menisi. So to pupils, and we have and. So it's and to pupils. And then we have. Anthomenicin, or andomenicin, 
and and this is another participle it means um, meeting like meeting together with and it's also in the dative plural so I think this goes with the pupils and meeting together with the pupils or the pupils meeting with something um, and then we have this word here apenthea or sorry not apenthea apenthea <laughs> apenthea and apenthea penthea means um, gr like grieving and it's, this ah here is the opposite. So it's free from grief, not mourning. So if, if you had pupils that were mourning, maybe you're crying. These are not from grief. Crying for some other reason. Um, and then we have the word that this goes with. This is actually in the accusative plural case. And then we have the next word, which is also accusative plural. It's vakria. And vakria means tears. So tears which are not from grief. Griefless tears. And then we have this word, tikto. Tikto means I I am released, basically. I am loosed onto into the world or something. I am released. So it's I am released. So let's unscramble this. Um, Oh, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. This word means I am released. I was going to say, I don't think TikTok means I am released. Um, I'm, I was looking at my notes wrong, sorry. Yeah, liome means I am released. We'll get to that. TikTok means I am... I um, This is a rare word for I beget. I bring to being. TikTok. Which actually does make a lot more sense here. So... Let me let me reread this. So, to the pupils, um, meeting the and meeting the pupils, I beget griefless tears. Okay. Let's reread what we have thus far. Again, we have. Um, I am the black child of a white father, a wingless bird, f flying even to the heavenly clouds. I beget griefless tears, or upon meeting, and upon meeting the pupils, I beget griefless tears. So you might be able to start putting together some guesses, but let's read the last line. That might help us a little bit more. So then we've got eftu, eftu, uh, which means right away, straight away. It's actually, usually it's an adjective that means straight um, or direct, but it can also be an adverb that means right away, straight away. So I think here it's straight away because we have an and right after it. And straight away, uh, we've got the de here meaning and, um, and straight away, then we have genetis, or sorry, genetis. I keep going back to my ancient Greek pronunciation ways. Genetis here is, um, and I think this is what also is confusing, confusing me. Um, this means begotten too, and I was like, that can't be right when I was looking at my notes. Um, yeah, genetis means having been begotten, having been born. And then we have liome, I am released. Liome. Is aera. Um, and this means into. And then aera means air. It's related to the word air. Um, so it sounds like air. It is air. Aera. So let's go back over all of it one more time. Imi patros lepkio melan tecos apteros ornis. Achri ke uranion itamenos nefeon. I am the black child of a white father and a wingless bird flying even to the heavenly clouds. Uh, now the second couplet. Cures 
landomenisin apenthea dacrua ticto ephthu de genithis liome is aera. Uh, I beget griefless tears upon meeting the pupils. And straight away, I am, having been begotten, I am released into the air. Okay, do we have any guesses about what this riddle could be? And if we need to, I can go over the English all in one go again, um, the translation, if we want to do that. Repeat the second couplet again, yes. Um, in English, I'm going to assume. So, upon meeting the pupils, I beget griefless tears, and right away, upon being born, I am released into the air. Have a guess, and it is smoke. Yes, kapnos is smoke. Yes, it is kapnos. It's smoke. You got it right. Excellent. That was fast. Yeah, it's smoke. It's a black child to a white father. Oftentimes, fire is just described as white in ancient Greek. We tend to think of it as like red or orange, and they could tell that it was red and orange and yellow, but usually they would just use the word white. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then, so it's like a black child, because the smoke is dark, of a white father, the fire. And it's a wingless bird, because it can fly up to the heavenly clouds, but it doesn't have any wings. Um, when it hits your pupils, you start tearing up, but it's not tears from grief, it's tears from the smoke. And right as you create it, it flies up into the air. Excellent. Yeah, I, I kind of find that these Greek riddles are a little bit easier than the Old English ones, because the... Anglo-Saxon ones, not only were they doing riddles, but they also use a lot of kennings, which are like metaphors inside of the riddles. So you have like riddles within riddles, and it gets really complicated really fast with Old English. In the Ancient Greek, you know, this, remember that this is hammered or like sandwiched in between math problems. So you can imagine this might have been like an instructive tool for students. You know, they do math problems, do some riddles, just like mental exercises. So, um, they're, I think they're meant to be more understandable and maybe more straightforward from like maybe a more analytical point of view, whereas the Old English ones are meant to stump you. <laughs> um, they're kind of meant to be super difficult. Um, th these can be pretty tricky sometimes, though, um, for sure. Um, so excellent job. That was actually really fast. <laughs> Thank you uh, for the participation as well. So um, let's go on to the next... Uh, riddle, which is a lot shorter. It's just one couplet. Actually, the next two are just one couplet. Um, and it's, I'm kind of glad that the short couplets come first because it was so late today, so we can still have time to do all of these. Um, the next couplet, I'll start by reading it, and uh, first, actually, I'll start by saying what number this is. So it's an iota and a theta, so that is 19. So the iota is um, 10, and then the theta is 9, so it's 19. Um, I'm what you might call a riddler. <laughs> I see. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to read it in ancient Greek. And then, or not ancient Greek, sorry. Early medieval Greek pronunciation of the ancient Greek text. <laughs> and then um, we're going to start translating it. So it's Idon ego potethira the ilis tmitosidiru. Uh, Uptian ortha trekonda posin vuch ipteto geis. It's actually kind of hard to read this in medieval Greek. I'm so used to having to read it in ancient Greek. Um, uh, I spent most of my time with ancient Greek outside of Koine Bible stuff doing uh, Greek lyric poetry. So it was a lot of very, very ancient Greek pronunciation with the pitch accent and everything. Um, so, 
Uh, Edon is our first word here, Edon, uh, which in ancient, ancient Greek would have been pronounced Edon. <laughs> Edon. Uh, ancient Greek had almost like a tonal situation where it was pitch accented. And this little squiggle over here means it's A. It's like a falling tone here. Edon. But it's Edon in medieval Greek and modern Greek too. Edon. Um, that would be the pronunciation of modern Greek. Edon means I saw. It's saw in the uh, first person singular. So I saw. And ego means I. So it's just the pronoun I. We don't get that all the time, but um, it could be there for emphasis. But here it's probably just to fill the meter so we have enough syllables <laughs> um, to fit the to fit the line. Because uh, it's not necessary. Even by itself tells you that it means I saw. So I saw. I saw. <laughs> um, pote means at some time. At some point. I saw. Once once upon a time, I saw. Theta. And this means a beast, a creature, a theta. Um, I'm trying to think of... Th there's definitely words in English that come from this, but I can't think of any. Um, <laughs> I guess theropod, like theropod dinosaurs, theta means beast. Um, but that actually might be a different root. I think it might be related to teras, which means fear. Might be mixing that up. I do know that there are descendants from this word in English, I just can't think of any. But in any case, theta is a beast here. So, once, at one time, I saw a beast. Okay. I saw a creature. Um, and then we have the, which I think is an abbreviation for, um, is it the, yeah. I think it's via is the, the preposition. It means through when it's followed by a genitive, which we have a genitive here. So, um, we actually have two genitives in a row. So, uh, once I saw a beast who, I saw a beast through, hmm. Uh, so, ilis means wood in the genitive. I love to see a beast. I love to see a creature. A theta can mean beast or creature, any kind of creature. Um, and we should be thinking more broadly than beast. Beast kind of conjures images of like large land mammals, I think. But theta can be more than that. It can be any any creature. Uh, once I saw a creature through, uh, ilis means wood. Um, but it's gentle. So through wood. And then we have this long word here, tomito sidiru. <laughs> tomito sidiru means, um, so the tomito part means cut, about seeing the creature. <laughs> um, well, so this riddle is just somebody bragging about seeing the creature. <laughs> it basically is starting that way, yeah. You're not special. <laughs> we all see creatures. Um, tomito, uh, this tomito part is related to temno, which means to cut, and then sidero, means uh, it comes from sideros which is iron so cut with iron and it's also genitive so it's describing the wood so once i saw a beast through wood that was cut with steel or iron uh i don't think the idea is that there was an iron axe and that this is literal wood i think we should be thinking metaphorically here something that you cut with iron <laughs> um this one might be a little bit tricky just because of cultural context, but um, I might try to provide some if that gets hard. I'll add some hints here. Um, but then we have this word, iption. Iption means uh, like lying on your back, supine. It's actually related to the word supine. Um, lying on its back. Um, and then we have ortha here, which is straight. Um, it's another word for straight. Um, I think it's related to the ortho in orthodox. Um, so, iption ortha. Uh, and, and they're both in the accusative singular. So they're both... This is describing that, I believe. Um, but it could also be describing this word, uh, trechonda, because that's also accusative singular. These could all be describe each other. Running straight on its back. Okay, 
Um, <laughs> posin, posin means uh, feet in the dative plural. So feet. Um, and then we have this word ve. Again, it just has an apostrophe because the next word starts with a vowel. So it's and. And something feet. Uch, which is not. It's the negative word. So not. Ipteto uh, means they were, or it was fastened. Um, and then we have reis. And the reis is genitive singular. Um, and when we put reis in the genitive singular, it means on the, basically. So um, reis, and then this is the word ye. Uh, uh, it has a lot of different pronunciations depending on dialect, but it is the word that gives us the word Gaia in English. Um, Gaia, like the goddess of the earth. Uh, Reis here means like on the ground, on the earth. So not fastened to the earth. Feet not fastened on the earth. Okay, let's go through all of it again. This one's a trickier one. Uh, once I saw a creature through iron cut wood running straight on its back. Its feet were not fastened to the ground. It wasn't walking on the ground, but it was running somewhere through something that's cut with iron. Um, often iron is another way of like obliquely referring to just blades in general um, through metonymy. So it could mean something cut with a blade specifically, not just any cut thing. Um, but do we have ideas or should I be giving more hints here? Does anyone have any ideas as to what this could be? Yes. Can I repeat it? Yes. So once I saw a creature through iron bladed cut wood, running straight on its back, feet not fastened to the ground. The feet were not fastened to the ground. So it wasn't running on the ground, it was running on something else through iron cut wood. And I think I already gave the hint that I don't think it's literal wood. Something else you cut with a blade that's not on the ground. No guesses. Okay. So I'm going to give more hints. Um, so... Hmm. I think the iron cut wood is not wood because it's not on the ground it's something else that people often cut with a blade i think the blade here is a razor <laughs> that, that's a very big hint Do you mind if I read what you wrote verbatim in the chat? <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> so someone in the chat says, what kind of creature would be dot 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 dot? And they said a fucking dot 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 louse? Four question marks. Yes, it is a louse. This is a really tricky one. Um, it's a louse. Yeah, razors were made of iron in ancient Greece. Um, yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? 
Uh, yes, I am not actually. No, I'm not kidding you. This is that's the actual answer, which is um, it's Thir. It's Thir is a louse. So the creature is a louse, and it's running through the iron cut wood. It's running through like body hair, basically, and yeah, it's not on the ground. It's on your body, which is uncomfortable <laughs> to think about. Um, yeah. Um, and then also the iron cut wood could even just be like the hair on your head too. Um, either way, you'd be using iron blades for that. So yeah, louse. Very good. <laughs> um, another wow. Yeah, it's a louse feed. Um, okay. Um, let's do one more. And we have just another single couplet one. The next few... Uh, we have a couple longer ones, so we'll do those next time. Let's put me after the lights. Oh, okay. Uh, no, you can call it a poem. It is a poem. It's written in elegiac poetic meter. Like, it's the kind of meter you're supposed to write sad poems about or love poems in. But we're doing math problems and riddles <laughs> in the same meter. Um, it's pretty fun. So, the next riddle, and this is Kappa and then Vita, that's 22. And again, I'm going to read it in uh, early medieval Greek pronunciation to the best of my ability. <laughs> we've got, uh, yeah, we've got Milege Kelexis Emon Unoma, Vive Selexe. O de palin mega thahma legon emon uno malexis. Okay. So the first two words, it's a great thing to be able to say in ancient Greek. Uh, mi lege is, so mi basically is a way to say not when you're saying don't do something. It's a, what's called a prohibitive no. No, do not. And then this word here is the imperative, the sort of command form of the verb that means to speak. So, do not speak. This is how you say shut up in ancient Greek. <laughs> uh, in ancient ancient Greek, this would have been pronounced me lege. Um, it's a falling accent. Right? It's a falling accent. I think it's a falling accent here. Oh no, this is a this is a low rising. This is like me. Me. Uh, is that right? I think so. Me lege. Yeah, melege. But in early medieval Greek, it's milege, milege. Um, shut up, <laughs> basically. Do not speak. Um, that's a great way to start the riddle. <laughs> Do not speak. Uh, K is here again, and. Uh, milege, K, lexis. Now this is the same root as this word, so it's the same verb, speak, but here we're in the future tense. This means you will speak. So do not speak, and you will speak, emon unoma. Emon is an epic ancient Greek way to say my, and unoma is name. Uh, in standard ancient Greek, I think this would have been onoma. But in epic, they needed a long, they needed a long vowel here, so they made it unoma, uh, or like a heavy syllable here, so they made it unoma. Unoma is in words such as onomatopoeia, <laughs> the onoma and onomatopoeia, or the onim part of synonym or antonym. It's that same root. It means name in ancient Greece, um, in ancient Greek, um, and ancient Greece. <laughs> um, yeah. So do not speak, and you will speak my name. Okay. Uh, then we have vi de selexe. So vi means that something is necessary for someone. It's it's how ancient Greek does saying like must basically. Um, and then we have they here again uh, means and uh, or but. And I think here it's going to mean but because we had a prohibitive here, and then what we have here is a question. This. Uh, semicolon here, which is probably only barely on the screen for most of you right now. I'll scooch over a little bit so you can see it better. Yeah. 
uh, it's a semicolon indicates a question in Greek. Uh, so we have questions. So, but is it necessary? And then se means for you. So is it necessary for you? And then we have lexe. And lexe means uh, to have spoken. It's again the same root. So do not speak and you will speak my name. But is it necessary for you to have spoken? Did you need to talk? <laughs> Did you need to open your mouth? Uh, okay, this is interesting. I feel like this isn't a riddle, but like a roast, maybe. <laughs> They're just like, don't speak and you'll be speaking my name. But did you need to speak at all? I oh, love this bitchy riddle. Okay, yeah, me too. Um, then we have ove. Ove here, which means thus. It's one of my favorite words in ancient Greek. Ove. In ancient, ancient Greek, this would have been pronounced hode. Hode. But it's ove in medieval Greek. Ode. Palin. Palin is again. But again. And then we have mega, and I don't think I need to translate mega here uh, <laughs> at all. Um, I'm just going to confirm with the chat. Do I need to translate mega? <laughs> it's also an excuse for me to take a drink because I'm thirsty. Should I translate mega? Does it mean mega? Yes, it does mean mega. Mm -hmm. It means great, big. Um, so it can be big in the literal sense or great in the importance sense, just like mega can. Um, and thathma, here is this next word, thathma. Um, the only thing, the only English word that comes to mind that this is related to is the word thaumaturge or thaumaturgy, which is an old, old way to talk about witchcraft in a very fancy way. <laughs> In a lot of older texts, you'll see the word thaumaturgy. Um, I've seen people self-describe as thaumaturgs before. Uh, it just means practitioner of magic. So thafma means a marvel, something that's marvelous. Um, so a great, a mega marvel. Um, do not be thinking about <laughs> any kind of comic book related thing, please, because that's not what I mean by marvel here. A marvel, something that's wondrous. Um, so a mega marvel, and then we have again. <laughs> Thank you, chat. Um, we have again this root for speak here, legon, and here it is the participle speaking, and then emon unoma again, my name, lexis. You will speak. We had lexis before. So let me read it. The the um couplet in uh, early medieval Greek and then in the translation that we just did one more time. So we have Mi lege que lexis emon unoma, vives elexi, o de palin mega thauma, legon emon unoma lexis. Do not speak and you will speak my name, but did you have to have spoken? Thus again, um, Thus again, speaking a great marvel. Uh, this is actually a little bit hard to parse. Um, thus again, a great marvel speaking my name, you shall speak. This is what it says in order. So maybe, thus you shall speak a great marvel. Thus you shall speak. A great marvel speaking my name. Yeah, I guess because it would be an oxymoron to say it. <laughs> so because do not speak and you shall speak my name. But was it necessary for you to speak, to have spoken? Thus again, you, you will have spoken a great marvel. You will speak a great marvel speaking my name. Do we have any ideas? <laughs> if you don't speak, you are saying the name of the answer of this riddle. 
So was it necessary for you to have spoken? Again, you have spoken a great marvel, speaking my name. Yep, yep, you got it. That was fast, yeah. Uh, silence, and there are a couple words for silence in ancient Greek. Uh, Siopi, um, it's one way to pronounce it in this era of Greek, and the other is uh, Sigi. Um, I think you can also say um, Aki, but Aki means point as well, it's unrelated. But, um, yeah. Three for three. <laughs> Uh, with the people in the chat getting this immediately. Excellent. Um, I think the last one was a little bit trickier, uh, but this, yeah, silence. I really like, I, I really do like how I think someone in the chat said, this is a bitchy riddle. <laughs> Shut up and you'll say my name. <laughs> was it necessary for you to have spoken at all? Because you're already saying my name having spoken, or having not spoken. Okay. So, you see, technically we could go into the next one, but I kind of want to save it for next time. So, I think that's where we're going to stop for today with the riddles. Um, I wanted to see if anyone had any questions about um, these riddles. Um, I might not know the answer, but I can uh, try to find the answers and put them in the notes of the um, YouTube video <laughs> when I upload this. Um, someone said, wow. Um, don't know what that's in reference to, but um, my question is, why am I so good at these riddles? See, I can't answer that one, um, and I don't think I'll be able to find that answer and put it in the <laughs> in the video description when this goes up. But um, I think you can answer that for yourself. Um, so um, <laughs> next time, uh, and yester lore, which will be in two weeks. Um, unless we do some kind of impromptu change in schedule. Uh, I will be uh, doing the other three uh, of these riddles from the Greek anthology. And then I think the following yesterday we'll be doing something very different. Um, we might, I think we might go back to do something Germanic philology. Yeah, so excited for so excited for more riddles in two weeks. Yeah, I'm excited too. I'm kind of bummed that we're not going to do it next week, but I am excited for calling with me. It's been a while since we've done a proper calling with me, so um, that'll be fun next week. Um, also, keep an eye out on um, the uh, just the stream because I might be doing some impromptu gaming this weekend. I might stream that um, or some impromptu uh, calling detour or something. Um, I do want to do a follow-up to the Conling Detour I did last week because I've developed the language a lot more since then. So yeah, but I think I'm going to do some gaming probably this weekend and stream that. Gamer era. Yeah, well, it is going to still be tangentially related to the stuff that I'm doing on this stream. Um, I'm still going to be doing philology stuff. Uh, what game that is to be um, revealed? Do you know what game? Um, I have a couple options I'm thinking about, but... Um, still not ready to reveal it because I still need to decide between a couple things. Um, epic. Epic even more so than the epic Greek that this is written in. Yeah. Um, Halo. I can assure you that it is not Halo that I'm going to be playing. It will be related in some way to um, either Yester or Conling with me. We'll see. Um, but yeah, I, th I think I might start doing that from time to time. Um, streaming some gaming. Top Call of Duty. No, it is not Call of Duty. Nice guesses, though. Um, by nice guesses, I mean these are as far as you could possibly be from what it is going to be. Um, so yeah, uh, great guessing the riddles. Not so great guessing what game it will be, but thank you everyone for being here, and thank you everyone in the future watching the uh, recording of this stream. I hope you have a great rest of your time zone, and uh, goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>